Please stand by. Your program is about to begin. If you should need any audio assistance during your call, please press star zero. Good day, and welcome to the Philip Morris International First Quarter 2023 Earnings Conference Call. Today's call is scheduled to last about one hour, including remarks by Philip Morris International Management and the question and answer session. In order to ask a question, please press star followed by the number one on your touchtone phone. Media representatives on this call will also be invited to ask questions at the conclusion of the question from the investment community. I will now turn the call over to Mr. James Bushnell, Vice President of Investor Relations and Financial Communications. Please go ahead, sir. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Earlier today, we issued a press release containing detailed information on our 2023 first quarter results. You may access the release on PMI.com. A glossary of terms, including the definition for smoke-free products, as well as adjustments, other calculations, and reconciliations to the most directly comparable U.S. GAAP measures for non-GAAP financial measures cited in this presentation, and additional net revenue data, are available in the exhibit to the Form 8K published this morning and on our Investor Relations website. Growth rates presented on an organic basis reflect currency-neutral adjusted results excluding acquisitions and disposals. As such, figures and comparisons presented on an organic basis exclude Swedish match up until November 11, 2023. Today's remarks contain forward-looking statements and projections of future results. I direct your attention to the forward-looking and cautionary statements disclosure in today's presentation and press release for a review of the various factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from projections or forward-looking statements. It is now my pleasure to introduce Emmanuel Babo, Chief Financial Officer. Over to you, Emmanuel. Thank you, James, and welcome, everyone. I am pleased to report that Q1 performance exceeded our expectations with strong underlying momentum from ICOs, Zine, and our combustible business. As mentioned at our full year earnings in February, we expected this quarter to be the weakest of the year due to a confluence of transitory factors impacting our top and bottom line. In this context, our business delivered robust results and we look forward with confidence to the remainder of the year. Smoke-free net revenues made up almost 35% of total PMI, despite the impact of adverse timing factors on HTU shipments, with an increasing number of markets crossing the 50% threshold. ICOs continue to deliver strong share and user growth across its geographies, both with the Blade version and Iluma. We are launched, Iluma's excellent traction with both existing ICOS user and legal edge smoker is boosting growth, demonstrating the dynamism and importance of our ongoing innovation. Iluma's progress is especially notable in the first launch market of Japan, where share growth has accelerated in recent quarters. In combustibles, accelerated pricing across a range of markets helped to deliver robust organic net revenue growth. Swedish Match delivered impressive results with a standout performance from Zins plus 47% U.S. shipments volume growth compared to the first quarter of 2022. Following an encouraging start to the year, we are well set up to deliver strong performance in 2023, including excellent top and bottom line growth for the remainder of the year. Turning to the headline numbers, our Q1 organic net revenues saw robust growth of plus 3.2% against a very strong prior year quarter with organic growth of plus 9%. This reflects the continued strength of ICOs and a step up in pricing, but was partially offset by expected HTU inventory movement, which I will come back to. This organic figure does not include the excellent plus 14% ex-currency top-line growth of Swedish match led by Zin. Our total reported currency neutral net revenue 
grew by plus 9.6%, with combined pro forma adjusted net revenue increasing by around plus 4%, also excluding currency. Our total organic net revenue per unit grew by plus 4.4%, with strong combustible pricing of plus 7.4%, partially offset by HTU dynamic in Japan and Germany, which I will come back to momentarily. We delivered Q1 adjusted diluted earning per share of $1.38, well above our previous expectation. This reflects a strong underlying delivery from our existing operation, excellent Swedish match performance, and favorable phasing on interest costs. Compared to a record high prior quarter and with a number of one-off or accentuated margin headwind from inflation, supply chain inefficiency, and timing factors as flagged previously, our adjusted diluted EPS contracted by minus 4.4%. Let me now walk through the mechanics of our Q1 net revenues we delivered overall adjusted net revenue growth of plus 4.6% on an organic shipment volume decline of minus 1.1%. While not included in this number, Swedish Match's smoke-free volume grew by an excellent plus 10%, adding impressive accretion to our overall growth profile. Combustible and HTU pricing, excluding Germany and Japan HTUs, contributed plus 5.3 points of growth, including positive HTU pricing in a number of markets. This was partly offset by a negative 1.3 point HTU impact from Germany and Japan. The larger of the two was Germany, reflecting a full quarter of the 2022 excise tax increase for which we await a court ruling later this year. In Japan, the October 2022 excise tax increase and transition to Iluma were also a drag on our top line, and we expect some of this impact to phase out in the second half. While the increasing mix of HTUs in our business at higher net revenue per unit continues to positively impact our performance, Lower shipments in Europe this quarter due to wholesaler and distributor inventory movements limited the benefit. This was also the main driver for the difference between our smoke-free organic net revenue growth and HTU shipment volume growth. We expect this positive mix shift to accelerate as both smoke-free organic net revenue growth and HTU shipment growth align more closely with off-tech trends for the year, as they also did in 2022. The positive mix impact of HTUs, overall volume growth, and pricing are powerful drivers of our transformation and growth. As expected, the first quarter was impacted by peak margin headwinds at both the gross margin and adjusted operating income level. Our gross margin contracted by 0.6 percentage points due to the net impact of COGS inflation, pricing, volume, mix, and productivity savings. We expect the positive elements of pricing, productivities, and favorable HTU category mix to increasingly compensate and ultimately outweigh inflation as we progress through the year. Supply chain disruption and the accelerated transition of consumers and our business to Iluma accounted for a further 0.6 percentage point impact. We anticipate these items to abate as we progress with Iluma launches and gain efficiencies in our supply chain, including a return to sea freight. In addition, specific cost phasing and the geographic mix of inventory movement notably for HTUs in Europe, impacted our gross margin by 1.8 percentage point in the quarter. Despite these exceptional Q1 dynamics, we continue to forecast the full year 2023 margin impact of our eat not burn business to be favorable as inventory movement and Iluma-related factors dissipate. Therefore, 
And as explained previously, we expect a progressive improvement in our gross profit and OI margin, notably weighted towards H2 as Edwin subsid and the underlying driver of our transformation accelerate. At around 26% of adjusted net revenues, our Q1 SGNA costs are at a similar ratio to the full year 2022. However, as expected, there was a notable increase compared to Q1 2022, given lower commercial spend at the beginning of last year, the inflationary environment, cost phasing, and front-loaded commercial investment. Our successful cost efficiency programs continue to deliver, enabling ongoing investment and helping to mitigate inflation with $150 million of growth saving realized in Q1, of which almost $50 million were from SGNA. Importantly, we expect a significant slowdown in SGNA growth to a level below the rate of net revenue growth for the remainder of the year, which will support OI margin improvements. This brings me to the outlook for 2023. Our robust Q1 performance supports visibility on strong full year growth. We continue to expect plus 7 to plus 8.5% organic top line progression, with a targeted acceleration in HTU shipment volume growth versus 2022. As detailed in this morning's press release, our other operating assumptions remain unchanged, and we remind you that our organic metrics do not include the contribution from Swedish Match for the large majority of the year. Our updated full year adjusted diluted EPS forecast of $6.10 to $6.22 includes an estimated unfavorable currency impact of $0.30. Cents. Positive estimated impact from the euro and a number of other currencies are outweighed mainly by the weakness of the Japanese yen as well as the significant depreciation of the Russian ruble and the Egyptian pound. This range continues to reflect plus 7 to plus 9% currency neutral growth and does not include any contribution from a potential favorable excise tax ruling in Germany, which we would expect to add around 3 points to our adjusted diluted EPS related to 2023 tax payment. We continue to expect Swedish match to be low single digit accretive to our 2023 adjusted diluted EPS after financing and for an increase of around $200 million in our non-acquisition related interest cost, despite a relatively modest increment in Q1. As discussed at full year earning in February, this year's bottom line results are expected to be notably H2 weighted. However, we expect our organic net revenue growth to already accelerate in the second quarter into the high single digit. We forecast second quarter HTU shipment volume of between 30 and 32 billion with adjusted diluted EPS in the range of $1.42 to $1.47, including an estimated unfavorable currency impact of 13 cents. Looking ahead to the second half of the year, we expect close to double digit organic top line growth and a return to margin expansion. Looking uh, now at our full year forecast uh, through a different lens, after the temporary headwinds in Q1, we expect very strong performance for the remainder of the year. Despite ongoing margin headwinds and investment, we expect organic top line growth of plus 8 to plus 10 percent, improving margin with expansion in H2, and currency neutral adjusted diluted EPS growth of plus 10 to plus 13 percent. This reflects the strong underlying drivers of our transformation with ICOS and ZIN driving volume at a higher net revenue per unit combined with stepped up pricing on combustible. Turning back to our results, our HTU adjusted in market sales volume grew by an estimated plus 16%, demonstrating continued strong growth momentum. HTU shipment volume of 27.4 billion units 
were towards the higher end of our forecast range, with growth of plus 10.4%, which was well below actual offtake trends as anticipated due to distributor and or seller inventory movement. As implied by our full-year HTU shipment forecast, we expect the rate of shipment growth to accelerate for the rest of the year as shipments converge with consumer offtake and to grow at a faster pace in 2023 than in 2022. Before detailing this inventory impact, it is important to note that in certain markets, such as Germany, IMS sales volumes are not measured at the point of distributor sales to the retail trade as the data is not available. In these cases, we instead use our shipment as the proxy. This means that shipment fluctuation can impact both IMS volume and reported market share and may not be representative of of tech dynamic. Given the volatility seen over this quarter and from now on, where there is a significant difference between estimated of tech performance and IMS data, we may choose to provide market share metrics based on adjusted IMS to better reflect of tech, where adjustments reflect the total estimated impact of distributor and all seller inventory movement. As you may note in the appendix to today's earnings release, this is the case for Germany this quarter, where we also provide historical figures. Coming back now to Q1, HTU shipment volume in several European markets were below consumer offtake. This is explained by the reversal of some inventory buildup at the end of Q4 2022 to meet the needs of Iluma launch, as mentioned at our full year result in February, and also to create some safety stock to mitigate the risk of production and distribution constraints due to energy shortages. As anticipated, we were able to adjust this safety stock in Q1 as the risk receded. We also decreased the level of ICO's blade HTU inventory in several markets to reduce the risk of upside stock given the rapid transition to Iluma. Notably impacted markets include Italy and Germany, where underlying market share and off-tech trends remain strong. Italian Q1 in-market sales volume grew by plus 21% compared to the prior year, with market share increasing from 15.4% in Q4 to 17.4% in Q1. In Germany, adjusted Q1 IMS volumes increased over 30% from the prior year, with adjusted market share up from 4.7% in Q4 to 5.3% in Q1. Now, turning back to the overall picture, while total Q1 cigarette and HTU shipment volume declined by minus 1.1%, our total IMS volumes were essentially stable and grew, excluding total estimated inventory movement. Our cigarette shipment declined by minus 3.1% with resilient trends in many markets. The decline includes a notable impact from a high prior year comparison in Japan and the introduction of an abrupt excise tax increase in Pakistan, resulting in an increase in illicit trade and an industry contraction of over 30%. Volumes also declined in the Philippines following industry pricing, with consumer purchasing power facing ongoing pressure. We continue to target stable, to positive combined cigarette and HTU shipment volume for the year, following growth in 2021 and 2022. This notably does not include the excellent growth prospect of oral nicotine, for which shipment volume grew by plus 10% in Q1. Most importantly, the exciting growth combination of ICOS and ZIN presents an unrivaled platform for growth over the coming years. Focusing now on combustible, our portfolio delivered robust Q1 organic net revenue growth of plus 3%. This reflects strong pricing of plus 7.4%, with a step up across many markets, including Germany, Indonesia, and the Philippines. With over 80% of planned 2023 combustible pricing implemented or announced, 
We have good visibility on the full year delivery, although some of the positive Q1 variants reflect earlier pricing compared to 2022. We now forecast a full year variance of plus 6 to plus 7%. Our cigarette category share declined by 0.3 percentage point in Q1, which was essentially all attributable to geographic mix as the total industry declined in large volume markets such as the Philippines and Pakistan. The impact of share movements within markets was neutral, with gains including Egypt, Poland, and Turkey, offset by decline in markets such as Ukraine, the Philippines, and Iraq. Importantly, we continue to target a stable category share in 2023 and over time, despite the impact of ICO's cannibalization. Moving now to our smoke-free product, we estimate there were 25.8 million ICO's users as of March 31st. This represents growth of close to 1 million adult users since December, with notable progress in Japan and Europe in addition to a broad range of other geographies. ICO Siluma has been a positive catalyst for volume and share growth across a broad range of launch markets, both supporting our strong position in the eat not Bun category with a super user experience and fostering further category growth. For existing ICO users, Iluma drives an accelerated upgrade cycle. This enhances retention and full conversion for the future, with a temporary margin impact from concentrated device sales. Indeed, we are now approaching an estimated 10 million Iluma users, with Iluma taking over 85% of HTU volume in the first launch market of Japan, Switzerland, and Spain. Iluma is also enabling better acquisition and conversion of legal edge smokers with market share acceleration visible in both earlier and more recently launched markets such as Italy and Korea. Since the introduction in these two markets in Q4, we are seeing encouraging trends in initial launch area and expect this to be increasingly visible at the national level over time as it is in Japan and Greece after a seasonal inflection in the latter. Our main focus in Q1 was on ensuring the success of Iluma in the 16 markets launched by the end of 2022, which cover over half of our ICO's business by volumes. In addition, we launched Iluma on a limited basis in Indonesia in February via our ICO's Club member program. This ICO's Club was introduced in 2019 and now has over 100,000 estimated users across 10 cities with a notable boost from the launch of Iluma. We expect to progressively launch Iluma in more markets this year. With Iluma accelerating ICO's growth were launched, PMI HTUs continue to strengthen their position as the second largest nicotine brand in markets where ICOS is present, with a record high share of 9% in Q1. Impressively, as of Q1, PMI HTUs are now the number one nicotine brand in 10 markets with the addition of Italy and Greece during the quarter. Focusing now on Europe, which under our new regional structure include additional markets such as Ukraine, our first quarter HTU share increased by plus 1.7 points to reach 9.2% of total cigarette and HTU industry volume adjusted for estimated wholesaler and distributor inventory movement such as those I mentioned earlier in Germany and Italy. On the same adjusted basis, IMS volume continued to grow sequentially and reach a record high of 11.1 billion units on the four-quarter moving average. This reflects strong progress across the region. We expect our Europe HTU volume to grow strongly in the remainder of the year, while, as in the past, our quarterly HTU share of market can be impacted by seasonality of cigarette consumption during Q2 and Q3. To give some further color on our standing progress in the region, slide 16 shows a selection of the latest key cities of tech shares. The success of ICOs continue across a diverse range of geographies from Western, Southern, Central, and Eastern Europe, including markets with and without Iluma. Notable standouts include Budapest, with over 35% 
of tech share as well as Rome and Athens reaching the high 20s. To my earlier comments, we are very pleased with performance in Germany where of tech share in Munich surpassed 10% for the first time. We are also encouraged by recent positive regulatory development in Greece where the Ministry of Health approved differentiated health claim for heated tobacco product. Greece is the first country outside of the United States that permitted health-related statements following a robust scientific assessment. In Japan, the eat not burn category now represents over 35% of total tobacco with ICOs driving category growth. The acceleration seen in recent quarters continued in Q1. Adjusted total tobacco share for our HTU brand increased by plus 3.4 points to 26.2%, with off-tech share surpassing 32% in Tokyo and 30% in Sendai. Adjusted IMS volume again grew sequentially, reaching a record high of 9 billion units on the four-quarter moving average. Strong performance in Japan further highlights the importance of continuous innovation and a broad consumable portfolio. Our premium price Terea HTUs and mainstream price Sentia HTUs continue to grow through Q1, strengthening their position as the two largest eat not burn brands. We are delighted with the progress in Japan, and as we look forward to further robust volume growth in the coming quarters, we would also like to remind you of the seasonality impact on quarterly share metrics. In addition to strong ICO's gains in developed countries, we continue to see very promising growth in low- and middle-income markets, which are now approaching 30% of our total HTU volume. This slide highlights a selection of Q1 key city of tech shares across markets in Eastern Europe, the Middle East, Asia, and Latin America. Notable successes include Bulgaria, with Sofia of tech share of over 16%, and Egypt, where off-tech share in Cairo reached 7.5%. We also continue to see robust off-tech volume growth across these important future markets. Now, moving on to Swedish match business, <coughs> which delivered an excellent Q1 performance with currency neutral net revenue growth of plus 14% and smoke-free product comprising 77% of total net revenues. Most impressive was the continued outstanding performance of Zin in the U.S. with plus 47% volume growth to 73 million cans. While volume growth benefited from inventory movement, including restocking in California following the December flavor ban, underlying growth in volumes was very strong, estimated well above plus 30%. We are also pleased with the Q1 performance in other U.S. smoke-free categories, including Moistness, which gained plus 0.8 percentage point category share and delivered shipment volume growth of plus 3 percent. The smoke-free category in Scandinavia continued to grow, driven by nicotine pouches, albeit at a slower rate following January's new excise tax increase in Sweden and Norway, with destocking accentuating the volume decline for Swedish match premium skewed snooze portfolio. In cigars, the business delivered positive pricing and robust shipment volume growth of plus 4% in a declining category driven by the strong development of natural leaf varieties. Finally, I would like to congratulate Swedish match employees for continuing to deliver excellent results as we thoughtfully integrate our activities. The integration is progressing very well, and we look forward to sharing more on our combined growth plan later this year. Now, let's examine Zin's recent U.S. performance in more detail. Super progress continues with a record increase in 12 months rolling shipment volume of 23 million cans, which equates to plus 40% growth. Category volume share remain essentially stable despite continued heavy competitive discount discounting from less premium offerings. Importantly, retail value share for Zin also remains strong at 75.6%, highlighting its premium positioning and superior brand equity. 
There are two key engines driving the U.S. growth of Zin as covered at Cagney. First is a progressive increase in distribution with a number of stores plus 13% higher than Q1 2022 at around 140,000. There remains ample opportunity to further increase this over time. Second are velocity or the number of cans sold per store per week. Zin velocity is going to grow sequentially and by an impressive plus 21% compared to prior year as the brand continues to resonate with adult nicotine users. Now, let me update you on our exciting plans to further accelerate our small free journey. As previously mentioned, the full global rollout of ICO Siluma is a major priority. We are on track to make substantial progress this year as HTU manufacturing constraints continue to ease. We continue to work on our ICOS US commercialization plan for launch in Q2 2024, in line with the principle outlined at the recent Cagney conference. With the benefit of the expertise and commercial tools from launching ICOS successfully in over 70 international markets, and a US market with a clear regulatory framework and the ability to communicate with adult smokers, we remain very positive about the opportunity. Importantly, we believe we can make the necessary investment in the U.S. business, generating additional top-line performance while continuing to deliver strong bottom-line growth for PMI during the investment period. In addition to our premium offerings, we are continuing to focus on Bones, our latest eat not burn innovation, that is especially relevant for low- and middle-income consumers. Pilot launches in the Philippines and Colombia are progressing well, and we intend to continue taking the learnings from this market before deploying on a wider scale. Another key mid-term opportunity from the Swedish match combination is the international expansion of nicotine pouches, notably within the world's leading brand. At Cagney, I mentioned we are targeting up to 10 launches or relaunches this year as we look to develop the category with adult smokers who value the convenience specific use occasion, test, and satisfaction. We expect this to commence in a few markets this summer, including both developed and emerging countries. While staying clearly focused on the eat not burn and nicotine pouch category, which present the largest and most accretive growth opportunities, we are adjusting our Vive e-vapor portfolio approach. We intend to focus on commercializing in select markets and prioritizing profitability given the known category challenges. Viv1 is a new pod-based system providing an enhanced user experience with fully outsourced manufacturing of devices and consumable to optimize cost. Viv1 will replace the current Viv product and as a result, we no longer intend to file a PMTA for the former technology. Instead, we will focus our near-term FDA engagement on ICOS and Zin. We will come back on future e-vapor FDA authorizations in due course. For this possible, the fastest growing e-vapor segment, we are rebranding Viva to Vive now. All of our e-vapor products will now be under the single recognizable brand Vive for a seamless consumer experience. We will introduce a new V1 platform in Canada later this month and will apply an agile and disciplined approach for further V rollout later this year. Moving to sustainability, I want to first draw your attention to our 2022 integrated report published earlier this month, which outlines the progress we are making towards achieving our purpose and smoke-free future. The report provides a comprehensive run-through of all of our most material sustainability topics. This includes those in focus for investors such as post-consumer waste, youth access prevention, decarbonization, and our resource allocation towards advancing our smoke-free transformation. In conjunction with the integrated report, we also published an updated ESG KPI protocol providing even more robust criteria on how we define success and measure ESG performance. It focuses on the KPIs included in our sustainability index, which as outlined in our 2023 proxy statement, continue to represent 30% of our long-term performance-based 
Equity Executive Compensation. I am also proud to announce that we released our first TCFD report yesterday, which updates and compiles our previous disclosure on how we are implementing the recommendation of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures in one document. This will be an important topic for many companies as reporting regulations evolve. Lastly, we are also pleased that following CDP's AAA recognition, PMI was again included in CDP's Supplier Engagement Leaderboard, contributing toward achieving our Scope 3 ambitions. To conclude today's presentation, we are on for strong performance in 2023, despite margin headwinds. Our underlying growth fundamentals remain strong, and we expect these headwinds to progressively ease through the year. Indeed, we delivered higher than expected Q1 results, which put us on track for the third consecutive year of high single-digit organic net revenue growth. Continued excellent ICOs and ZIN performance further enhances our position as a global smoke-free champion with leadership position in the largest category of eat not burn and the fastest growing category of oral nicotine. We are taking action through pricing in combustible and our cost-saving initiative to recover cost inflation as we progress rapidly toward our ambition to become a majority smoke-free business. Finally, we remain a highly cash-generative business with an unwavering commitment to our progressive dividend policy. We look forward to further rewarding our shareholders as our transformation delivers sustainable growth. Thank you, and we are now extremely happy to answer your questions. Thank you. We will now conduct the question and answer portion of the conference. Again, in order to ask a question or make a comment, please press star key followed by the number one on your touchtone phone. In the interest of fairness of time, we ask that participants keep the maximum of two questions each. If time allows, follow-up questions may be taken. You may rejoin the queue by again pressing star then one on your touchtone phone. We'll take our first question from Bonnie Herzong with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So, Morning, buddy. Hi. I guess I have a question on your guidance as it relates to Q2. It does now seem to be a bit lighter, implying a lot more of the growth is now expected to be in the back half. So just, you know, trying to get a sense of how conservative your Q2 guide might be. And then really, Emmanuel, how much visibility, you know, and confidence you have that your business really can accelerate and outperform the second half. Maybe you could highlight for us you know, some of the key puts and takes that give you this confidence and, you know, maybe where you see the greatest um, potential upside sure. and also the color and effect. <laughs> okay, no, sure, Bonnie. Happy to do that. And, and I guess, you know, thanks for the question because that helped me clarify certainly the, the phasing uh, of uh, the profit generation this year. I think when, we're not coming with um, uh, any different message from what we said back in February. We always said that... Uh, uh, we would be facing in the first half of the year a number of headwinds on profitability, uh, that there would be some inventory movement playing. We highlighted that and we clearly said uh, there will be margin improvement coming in the second part of the year. And we are coming today exactly with the same message. We are pleased to have a Q1 that is above our initial expectation. We never gave a guidance until today on Q2. Uh, but I think what we are seeing today on Q2 is coming with a lot of positive. We are explaining that we do expect uh, an acceleration of the top line. We are talking about high single-digit growth that we are targeting for the second quarter. Uh, and that's, of course, going to be uh, a very nice uh, contribution to the performance in the second quarter. That is highlighting the momentum that we have on the business that we see behind ICOs. Uh, that is not capturing the zinc growth for the second quarter. So zinc is just coming in addition to this organic growth. So I think it gives an idea of how uh, nicely uh, up and running and dynamic is our business. Now, in terms of margin, it is true that, again, in Q2, we're going to have a number of headwinds, and notably at the level of the gross margin. So we're going to continue to have um, a number of impact coming from inflation. Uh, this is going to be progressively corrected, but I think you should expect another quarter with a gross margin rate uh, declining 
uh, in a material manner versus uh, 2022. And then the second part of the year will be uh, showing uh, improvement, again, in line with our initial thoughts. Where I guess you're going to start seeing in terms of margin evolution uh, some more positive impact, this is on the revenue, uh, sorry, uh, 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 SGNA exactly. to revenue ratio, where we have seen uh, a deterioration in Q1. Um, I think, I'm not saying that uh, we will have uh, SGNA growing at a lower pace than revenue in Q2, but I expect the growth of SGNA in Q2 to be closer <clears throat> to uh, the revenue, and therefore that will weigh uh, uh, less on the uh, operating income margin. But that's really what you should, uh, you should expect in terms of, uh, of sequence uh, for the year. Again, uh, we expect a very nice acceleration for the top line, just confirming uh, the nice momentum that we uh, are experiencing in the business. And we have this ramp up on the margin that is coming progressively. It's going to show up first at the level of the sg and on revenue. And in H2, we are expecting, as we said, a better evolution of the gross margin rate. Uh, so far, we're just confirming initial expectation. Now, well, that's super helpful. It just sounds like you've got some pretty good visibility. So that's, yeah, definitely helpful. And then I guess just maybe a quick high-level question on, you know, the health of the consumer in sort of your key markets, if you could kind of touch on that for us, you know. And then in the context of that, you know, you've certainly been putting in, you know, stronger combustible SIG pricing. So just love to hear a little more color on how the consumer has been responding to those actions and really how confident you are that you're going to be able to continue to push through that pricing for the remainder of the year. Thanks. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm not going to say that uh, we don't see any pressure on the consumer uh, in the world. It is quite obvious. And, of course, you know, I'm not talking about the U.S., uh, which maybe you could deserve a separate comment. But uh, it is clear that in countries such as the Philippines, for instance, uh, we see some impact uh, on the business coming from purchasing power. I think we see some of that as well in Indonesia. So there are markets where there was already some pressure on purchasing power, possibly leading to some down trading, and that has continued to play um, as we, we progress uh, through the beginning of 2023. But I have to say that in many markets, um, we haven't seen clear signs so far. We have to stay very cautious, of course, of uh, pressure on the consumer uh, or you know, massive down trading. We, we don't see that. Uh, the Marlboro market share was a bit down, but, you know, uh, I don't think that, uh, that that is clearly reflecting uh, at, that, at that stage a pressure on, on the premium part of our portfolio. And, um, and, and we've been increasing price, as you have seen, in a very significant manner. Of course, co you know, competition not immediately or not totally responding uh, to our price increase uh, that can have an impact on our uh, market share. But I would say so far we have the feeling that in a highly inflationary environment, the consumer is taking as normal and is not, um, is not seeing as uh, an issue to see also price increase on, uh, on his uh, tobacco product. All right. Thanks for that color, Manuel. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take our next question from Gaurav Jain with Barclays. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, and thank you for taking my questions. So the first morning, question I have is on, good morning. So the first question I have is on FX. So in Feb you had guided for a 15 cent headwind. Now it is 30 cents. Egyptian pound had depreciated by Jan, and then you know yes, yen has gone down a bit, but euro, which is a much bigger currency for you, is up also a bit more than that. So so ruble can't be that big, right? Or is it becoming bigger this year versus last year? So could you just help us explain the FX? Yeah, Gaurav, so um, I think you, you, you rightly pointed to the ruble. Actually, if you, uh, I'm not going to disclose currency by currency, but if you look at the ruble, just the ruble is more than the net impact of 30 cents that today we are anticipating for the year. Uh, so I think it shows a very strong impact of the ruble. And the Egyptian pound, you know, continue to devaluate um, after January. So it's, uh, I'm not sure we had the full impact of the Egyptian pound. And actually, if you, you accumulate ruble and the Egyptian pound, you have 80% of the uh, net impact of 30 cents. It's a net impact, don't get me wrong, because you have also the yen that is 
quite negative, and then you have the euro and a number of other categories that is that is positive. Uh, but I think with the ruble and the Egyptian pound, uh, you have a pretty good explanation of the net impact. I hope it's it's helpful. Okay, sure. Thank you. And second, you know, uh, you know, the U.S. cigarette volumes industry level are quite weak. You know, minus nine. And I'm looking at you know the European data that you shared. It is the industry volumes are flat on what were already very strong comms. And you know the reasons what are being mentioned for the U.S. industry weakness, which is macro weak consumer, you know, stimulus payments going off, uh, disposable e-cigarette growth. I could apply the same logic to EU consumer, EU smoker, and still the volumes are so much better than trend. So is there a, can you explain, like, why are the U.S. smoker and EU smoker, why are they behaving so differently? Gaurav, I cannot, and I will have to confess that I'm not the greatest specialist of the U.S. consumer for combustible cigarettes. So, I, I, you know, I won't dare myself to uh, give an analysis. I think it's in line with my previous comment on the fact that so far we've been a pretty good resistance uh, from the consumer uh, to... Um, um, uh, you know, seeing price increase and, and coping with inflation um, in Europe. I'm not able to tell you why uh, there is a difference here. We know that the social model in Europe is different. You may have some more protection, some more safety nets, you know, that are, that are playing and maybe uh, limiting uh, the impact of inflation. There was maybe more compensation, you know, given uh, from various governments on trying to fight against energy price increase and, and sometimes uh, compensating uh, f um, agricultural product inflation um, um, uh, across a number of geographies. So that can be uh, one element to explain why the European consumer is resisting better. But I, I'm not going to pretend that I have uh, the perfect answer to your question. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll take our next question from Pamela Kaufman with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Good morning, Pamela. Uh, I was hoping that you could elaborate a bit more on your SG&A SG investment for this year. Uh, what are the key areas that you are investing behind and uh, the stepped up inve investment in Q1? Um, I guess how much of this reflects structural increases in inflation, uh, driving higher costs versus incremental investment that you're making behind, you know, Illuma and your uh, health and wellness and uh, Swedish match businesses. I mean, I'm going to try to go as far as I can. As you can imagine, you know, some of that is super sensitive, so we're not going to share in detail, you know, what we are investing uh, and, and, and where. Uh, first of all, uh, trying to give you perspective for the full year. Uh, we believe we're going to have uh, our SGNA uh, growing faster than uh, revenue organically. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we expect uh, a, a limited discrepancy between the two. So that means that as we progress through 2023, you should expect the growth of our SGNA to converge. Uh, with um, the, the top line growth, I'm speaking here organic, uh, and Q1 is really, uh, I would say, impacted by a number of one of both. By the way, on the basis of comparison, if you look at our uh, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 numbers last year, you know, sequentially you will see that Q1 was very low, um, both because uh, we did not invest at the same moment of the year, so there is a phasing in investment and also because there was some one of positive last year. So don't take Q1 as, as a reference. Having said that, uh, we are facing inflation, of course, in our SGNA. It's a lot of people cost, and of course, we are increasing uh, salaries. Uh, but we are also indeed generating some efficiency. So that is giving us some leeway to invest on our priority. It's about, of course, commercial investment on our priority, as you can expect. So it's everything uh, on marketing, commercial to boost uh, ICOs. Uh, that is, of course, a big, uh, a big driver. Uh, it is the investment that we are making uh, to prepare the U.S. Uh, we talk about the investment that we are making in wellness and healthcare. Uh, we continue to innovate a lot. Uh, we have innovation in the pipe uh, for all our smoke-free um, uh, product, and, of course, that is also having some impact. So that is really what is driving uh, this growth, um, and we continue to see as important 
this capacity that we have uh, to cope with inflation, uh, to uh, invest for the future, and at the same time to have an SGN evolution that, thanks to the dynamism of the, of the business, is allowing us to still generate nice operating income and um, uh, net profit growth. That's what I can share with you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then can you talk about your change in your ESIG strategy? What prompted your uh, strategy towards ICOS Vive? And how are you thinking about the category over the long term and your participation in it? Look, I think we've always been clear that uh, while we were clearly developing some offering on uh, the vaping category, this was not our priority. We had ICOS. And now I would say we are even, you know, more taken by two varieties, which, which are ICOS and Zine. You know, when you have such a fantastic uh, team uh, um, and, and the potential that they have to deliver very strong top-line growth, volume growth, revenue growth, and in a very nicely profitable uh, fashion, that's really the priority. Um, I guess you listened to us at Cagni and, and we expressed – uh, the questioning that we have on the vaping category today, uh, which uh, uh, are around uh, the absence of clear regulation in many countries, uh, the fact that that is giving way to inappropriate uh, marketing activities, uh, risk of uh, underage uh, consumption, and, um, and also the fact that this is a category where so far it's uh, difficult, I'm not saying impossible, but difficult to see uh, a, a lot of profitable model being developed, and therefore that is pushing us to look at that and continue to work on this category. And the fact that we are coming with this evolution of the range, I think, is just in line with the fact that the technology is evolving. We see the customer needs evolving as well. That's why we are developing Vive now. Um, but we're going to be focused. So it's not going to be across geographies. It's going to be where the vaping category is relevant. It's going to be where we have a differentiation where we have the commercial strength to make an impact. And I think it is a much better strategy to do that, develop a few successes instead of exhausting ourselves in trying to develop something global today when we don't see necessarily the ingredient or the driver for that to happen uh, in an interesting manner, uh, both in terms of growth, top line, and, and bottom line um, progression. Thanks. That's very helpful. Thank you. And we'll take our next question from Vivian Azer with TD Cohen. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Morning, Vivian. So my first question is a follow-up to um, Guarov's, please. In terms of your current FX outlook, does that contemplate another devaluation of the Egyptian pound? Because my understanding is that's pretty well expected at this point. So it, it does not because, of course, uh, we don't have uh, – any idea of what it could be, when, when it could happen. So these are really uh, an average that we take on the spot uh, in the, the day before uh, the announcement and not taking uh, any kind of forward-looking or whatever consensus, you know, for currency evolution. You have a lot of people today that believe that the euro is set for uh, a nice ride against the dollar in the coming uh, months. Frankly, we're not, you know, betting on any kind of possible evolution, but really just walking on the, uh, on the spot. Okay. That, that, that's fair. I understand you're not in the business of predicting currency. It just seems like this is tied to the IMF bailout, so it seems um, yeah. reasonable to expect. Um, my follow-up question then is on um, the Swedish match margins, which came in um, quite nicely. I was just curious, given the incremental um, inventory benefits that you saw in California, like how should we think about the 1Q margin in context? of a normalized margin? Was there an incremental margin benefit that we should be backing out mentally as we think about what the appropriate level of profitability is for that business? Thank you. Well, Vivian, I think uh, what I can share with you is that uh, I believe Q1 is just the bright uh, confirmation of what we said, i.e. Swedish Match is coming with a very nicely uh, accretive impact to the PMI growth. It is true for uh, the volumes, it is true for the revenue, and it is true for the profitability. So indeed, uh, Zin uh, growing in the U.S. very nicely, and I don't come back you know, on this north of 30% growth 
without the, uh, the, the impact of, of California. Um, that is driving a business that is nicely profitable, that is itself you know, accretive to the Swedish match average business, and therefore, of course, uh, to, to PMI. And it is just very good news to have this engine for growth. Frankly, I mean, I, I don't want to repeat myself, but Icos and Zin together, they're just a very exciting pair. And Zin is coming as a very uh, nice uh, top line and, and margin enhancement role. Um, and we expect that to continue. Understood. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll take our next question from Andre Condria with UBS. Please go ahead. Hi, Manuel. Thanks for taking Hi, my question. I have two from me, please, if you don't mind. Uh, firstly, on the input cost inflation side of things, obviously your Illuma margins will have, your, will have efficiencies coming online later this year. But in terms of the other headwinds you flagged, Leaf and Acetate Tau, is there any color where you, you can give on just how big these headwinds are? Well, they are very material, but, but we, we flag that. And um, I think once again, you know, we explained that uh, in Q1, and we expect that to continue in Q2, this big increase in energy price, leaf price, acetate tau, um, is going to be the biggest driver for the pressure on the growth margin. Now, as we enter uh, uh, the second half of the year, and notably towards the end of the year, uh, we believe that these elements will be, well, first of all, will be facing comps already with some of the bad news uh, in H2. So, of course, the uh, period-on-period -period comparison will be, of course, easier. And then we keep working on productivity. We may uh, keep working on, on our COGS, you know, to see all optimization. So this negative pressure, and nothing is going to disappear, but it's going to ease uh, versus what we are experiencing in H1. Uh, but I would expect in Q2 uh, the pressure to, to remain um, very strong uh, at that level. That's very clear. Thank you. And my second question is a bit more long-term. Obviously, we saw one of your peers come out with a new product at uh, their investor day for the nicotine pouch space for the U.S. And at the same time, your other peer is bringing the European product in. Um, is there scope for a similar innovation for Zin, given the criticism, well, rather the drawback it has, that it being a much drier product versus the yeah. European counterparts? Yeah. I believe that with Swedish Match, we have uh, the biggest specialist, super focus, uh, knowledgeable, um, player of the uh, uh, oral nicotine category. So we've been adding to that uh, amazing uh, uh, skill, uh, the 13, uh, you may remember that we bought this, this company that is specialized in formulation of products, some of them including nicotine, and that can also come with very nice um, uh, innovation in, uh, in the form factor. So uh, you should expect us of course, don't expect me to come now with detail, but you should certainly expect us to come with nice innovation. Uh, there is certainly the appetite in some area from uh, the consumer to uh, try new things, new you know, reduced risk product, uh, to uh, uh, develop uh, this uh, oral nicotine category in other spaces. Uh, probably the consumer doesn't know as well what can be done, so it's for us. It's our duty to come and uh, make some proposal, but I guess... You can expect us, and I think we've demonstrated that PMI and now you know, PMI plus Swedish match, to be leading innovation in this category as well in the future. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll take our next question from Matt Smith with Stiefel. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the question. Hi, Matt. The, the incremental number of ICOS users stepped up in the first quarter to about 900 million additional users on a sequential basis. Can you provide more details regarding the favorable, com favorable conversion trends you've seen behind Aluma? And should we expect ICOS user growth to accelerate in the second half as Aluma capacity improves and you expand uh, the geographical footprint of the product? 
Thank you. So, yes, we are close to a million uh, additional ICOS users um, in Q1. It's a nice number. It's not uh, uh, something that we cannot beat. I think that there is a possibility to further accelerate as we continue uh, in Q2 and, and, and beyond. Uh, but first of all, I would like to have a few words of cautiousness. You know, it's not a scientific number. That's an estimate, and that can have some variation um, depending on, uh, on, on a number of, uh, of, of elements. Uh, but I think directionally it is correct, and I think it shows the very strong momentum of ICO. It is confirmed, of course, by uh, the consumer of tech um, that we've been uh, describing. It is clear that Iluma is helping this conversion. So what we see with Iluma is a, a higher uh, capacity to convince smokers because it is a more seamless experience, there is no cleaning, it is mimicking even closer uh, the ritual of uh, the combustible cigarette. The overall experience is more satisfying, so the abandonment rate is lower, and of course we talk about net uh, user acquisition, so that is also uh, helping. We have very nice progression of uh, the consumer satisfaction in all countries, uh, that is, I guess, you know, uh, uh, probably supporting uh, the lower abandonment. So it is clear that the more we go for Iluma, uh, the more we are in the capacity to accelerate conversion. Japan, I think, I mean, we're coming with a number in Japan, and you can build the historic. I think Japan is, 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 is providing a lot of interesting information because it took some time. I mean, the acceleration that we have since Q3 in Japan is quite spectacular, frankly, and probably goes beyond our expectation. But it shows that... Iluma is probably you know, gradually uh, getting traction with, I don't know, it's a word of mouth, and, and, but, but the consumer is realizing that this is making a big impact, and frankly, the acceleration of the market share to north of 26%, and I'm not thinking about here, Tokyo, but average um, a Japanese market share, um, is, is, is a significant acceleration. Uh, it started in Q4, but it accelerated, and it's one year after the launch. So it shows that you know, not everything is happening in the first quarter of the launch. I think we're, we're showing a number of, of charts here showing that. And that bodes well for a nice ramp up, you know, in the coming quarters as not only do, do we have to start, you know, to launch Illuma in a number of countries, but we know that this positive effect uh, will spread uh, over the coming quarters. So we, we take that as a, as a nice driver for user acquisition growth in, um, in the coming quarters. Yes, thank you for that detail. And a, a follow-up on a comment you mentioned on the call about maintaining profit growth in the U.S. as you launch ICOS. Can you talk about the investment needs in the U.S. to support commercialization and, and how the $75 million or so of investment here in 2023 begins to, uh, begins to build out the infrastructure necessary for a broader ICOS launch? Yeah, well, that, that's the additional investment, but we, of course we are already starting with some investment in the U.S., uh, we'll come uh, at the time of the Investor Day in September with detailed um, plan on how we intend to grow ICOs in the U.S. And at that time, of course, we share much more color on the level of investment that we believe is going to be necessary. I think the important message, because we have a lot of questions here, is the fact that, yes, of course, you know, in order to express what we think is a great potential of ICOs in the U.S., investment will be needed. By the way, we've been investing, you know, to build this Phenomenal business for ICOs in Japan and Europe. I mean, we've been investing. It didn't come by chance. So we will invest in the U.S. But what we are seeing is that given the growth momentum that we have in the business, we think that investing in the U.S. behind ICOs will, first of all, provide even more momentum on the top line and that we can absorb this investment while continuing to grow the bottom line very nicely. We're not ready to compromise on bottom line growth. Uh, because of investment that we need to make in the U.S. If I want to repeat something that I said already, I think the question mark will be what is the differential that we can generate between top-line growth and bottom-line growth? Remember the last algorithm was 5 and 9, you know, above, five, above 9. Well, if we increase more than 5%, the uh, growth rate uh, perspective, it doesn't mean that we're going to keep four points of difference between top line growth and bottom line growth. That's the sense of, um, of the comment. I hope it's helpful. Very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll take our next question from Jared Dingus with JP Morgan. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, hi guys. Um, I want to ask about Zen growth in the U.S., which you know seemed to actually uh, accelerate in the offtake data, um, despite the base continuing to grow, and it's actually pretty pretty sizable now. Um, do you think there's any benefit there from from the investments that you started to make as part of your ICOS preparations in terms of building out maybe a sales network? Um, or are you also increasing SGA investments in in Zin alone? Um, you know, I'm just thinking of this in the context of you know the brands getting bigger. We're seeing you know the cigarette data has clearly been been very weak, but yet it, you know the brand continues to do very well. So just trying to understand what's yeah um, what's maybe driving that. Thanks, Jerry, for the question. Well, first of all, uh, yeah, we, we are, of course, extremely pleased with the performance of Zin in the U.S., um, and I want to pay a tribute to the, the, the work that the team is doing there, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, no, I don't think that there is yet a sizable impact coming from our investment in the U.S. I think it's being developed on the merit uh, of, uh, of, of the great commercial plan and action. Uh, the brand has amazing traction. I think that it's, it's extremely highly regarded by the consumer, premium brand, a very nice franchise. Uh, and they are building on these two drivers, as, as, as explained, one geography, the other one is, is a consumption per store. Uh, we just show that two things. One, uh, of course, we haven't reached uh, the full geographical coverage, and that's where probably in the coming uh, quarters you will see some acceleration as we're going to put more feet in the street um, and more capacity to visit uh, retail stores. And the other thing is that there is a growing knowledge, uh, understanding, and appetite for the category and for the that epitomize uh, the category, and that's what we are seeing. So, so far, uh, no really increased investment beyond the natural increase, you know, when you have such a nice growth. Of course, you increase investment year on year. So, we do increase investment in the U.S., but no, nothing kind of, at that stage, accelerated plan, and not yet impact coming from investment on ICOs. Uh, that should come um, in, in the future. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take our final question from Priya Arya Gupta with Barclays. Please go ahead. Hello, and thanks for squeezing me in. Um, Emmanuel, I was hoping that we could touch on your cash flow performance in the quarter a little bit. Um, it sounds like uh, the weakness was somewhat related to timing factors um, because 1Q is, is seasonally your, your weakest. Um, but if you could just walk us through sort of what the drivers for that negative cash flow sure. operations figure were, that would no. be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So in, indeed, uh, Q1 uh, has not been great in terms of cash flow performance, but that was, again, expected. Uh, that is linked with the timing of shipment, excise duty payment, and some of the working capital. Um, and there was nothing surprising. I mean, I would have preferred to see higher operating cash generation in Q1, but that was expected. And we are absolutely confirming uh, the objective for the year of an operating cash flow between 10 to $11 uh, billion. Okay, thank you. And then just a housekeeping item. Um, can you give us the pro forma leverage, um, including the benefit of Swedish Match for a full year versus the reported numbers that were in the release? No, I don't think it was in the release. I, I don't know whether we'll, we'll communicate that, but um, I mean, you, you, you can come to us. Your, I'm not sure to understand fully what's your question. Because we, we, I think you have the data to calculate things, but, but, uh, but you can come back to us and we'll see whether uh, we can show where, where the information is available. Sure. I, I think that the sequential increase in leverage, if you put in a full year's benefit of Swedish match, is closer to about two-tenths of the turn um, versus sort of the yeah. higher figure that was reported. Yeah, that, that, is that directionally I right? Think, yeah. No, I, th I think you're alluding to the fact that we concluded 2022 saying well, we are around 2.9 times, but of course that would be lower and significantly lower and maybe about what you are saying here uh, if you were to take uh, the full year of Swedish match. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. All right. And there are no further questions at this time. I'll turn the call back over to the management team for any closing remarks. Thank you all for joining today. That concludes our call. If you have any follow-up questions, please